Welcome to DSP Leaders World Forum. It's Monday the 11th of May and coming up now is our first discussion programme of the week where we'll be taking a strategic view on geopolitics and the new economic models for DSPs. If you want to ask questions later or join the extra shot with Ray the Major programmes, then get in touch with us as soon as possible. Do it today if you can. Details are on Telecom TV along with our related poll question. We'll be running new panel discussions every day this week, from strategy to business models to technology, all charting the evolution towards becoming digital services providers. So to our first panel, geopolitics and the new economic models for DSPs. Like any industry, telecoms doesn't operate in a vacuum. It is subject to numerous external influences, some beneficial, most far less so. You only have to look at the political interest in 5G, which intensified to new levels when governments across the world stepped in to question the suitability of, of certain vendors. So how will geopolitical factors impact the evolution of telecoms? And how will this affect economic models for CSPs? The investment climate for telecoms remains challenging. However, the COVID-19 pandemic illustrates the vital importance of high quality connectivity. No one said this was going to be easy. So time to meet our guests and I'm delighted to introduce Nick Willits, who is CEO of the TM Forum. Mike Conradi, who is partner at the law firm of DLA Piper. Duarte Bigonia, who is partner at McKenzie and Company and Jean-Pierre bien Chairman of the Telecoms Economic and Social Research Institute, IREST. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on Telecom TV. Much appreciated. Hello, good morning. Hello. Good morning. Hello, good morning. I think we need to split our opening topic into two, at least to start with, um, pre-COVID-19 pandemic and, and post. Nick, if, if I can come to you first, if we cast our minds back to the world as it was before this outbreak and global uh, lockdown, what was the state of telecoms? Well, it's a great question, Guy. From our perspective, I think the industry has finally come to grips with the need to transform. And as we went into this highly unusual situation, I think the industry was getting to grips with the fact that that transformation needs to happen faster than ever. And in many ways, the telecom industry is behind in many of its ambitions to seize growth, a lot of them attached to B2B. So we've certainly seen in the last 18 months or so, uh, a big push and acceleration of what we would call true business transformation, going beyond siloed operational transformation or transformation of the customer experience and looking at a true transformation of business models, transformation of the technology that supports them. At least that's now been recognized, at least the scale of it's recognized and perhaps the complexity of it. Um, and I think uh, that situation has, has continued actually even through this crisis. Thanks. And, and Mike, if I can come to you next. Um, same question, really. You know, how, how was telecoms faring uh, before we entered this lockdown phase? And, you know, w w what's been the impact as, we've, as we go through it? In our experience at the firm, we before COVID-19, we'd seen a lot of investment, a lot of interest in telecoms, uh, telecoms infrastructure and service provision. Uh, actually, it's been a very exciting time for the telecom sector, uh, whether you're looking at fixed broadband, uh, mobile networks, mobile network sharing, OSS, BSS, submarine cables, all of it. it was, there's a, been a lot of activity. Second part of your question was, what's the impact of COVID-19? And I, it, might, uh, it won't surprise you uh, f if I say we don't know yet. Um, I've seen some people argue that, it, that, it, that COVID-19 reinforces the need for more investment in telecoms and, if anything, might, might improve the business case. Uh, uh, and in that vein, we noticed, for example, the UK government uh, back a few weeks ago when we thought that £5 billion was a lot of money for the government to be spending, they announced they were going to be there was a big subsidy for, for um, broadband investment. Um, on the other hand, uh, actually, I, I think you might argue that one thing that's, that, that, that's been shown is that telecoms networks are more or less good enough to, to cope with, uh, with the new world. So, so I think the jury's still out as to what the impact will be uh, medium to long term. 
Duarte, um, a lot has changed since the um, outbreak began. A lot of businesses are undergoing rapid transformation, digital transformation. Um, how, how is telecoms faring, do you think? No, uh, I think that overall is they are doing quite well. So as we all seeing that basically there's a massive growth of users of bandwidth and people basically working from home schools working from home and uh, and then suddenly we basically moved people to connect to homes and to connect to the internet and to do uh, basically to work to get entertainment and uh, overall i think it's pretty amazing how how the, how the networks across the world have been uh, behaving i think it's basically it's quite extraordinary that we don't see complaints of people around the networks i think uh, everyone is basically keeping up their lives. And I think uh, if uh, anything is really working well is the, is the telecom networks. And I think they're basically doing a good job. Now, obviously, uh, I think the changes, the, the challenges that will come in the next uh, months, I think like any other industry, telecom will also have to adjust and, uh, and try to go back to this, this, to this new normal. Um, obviously, there's uh, there are, there are all telcos will have to go from models like shops and uh, a lot of uh, sales forces to do a lot of uh, selling remote, and I think this is already happening. Uh, obviously, there's a huge investment now on e-commerce, and so uh, one of the key things we are watching and seeing today in the telecom industry that many telcos are now trying to do in six months what they were not able to do in the last two or three years. So really accelerating the digital channels for either customer care, but also for e-commerce and, and sales. Uh, but overall, I think, so let's, if we split this discussion between the behavior of the networks, I think they are doing quite well. Now, like any other business, telecom will have to adapt and to become a digital player. Things that they've been doing for a long time, but now they need to really accelerate and make it a reality. Thank you. And Jean-Pierre, I'd like to ask you the same question as we, as we open this discussion. Um, what has been the health of the global telecoms industry um, before the pandemic? And uh, are there any indications yet of, of how it might be all changing? Yes, Kai. Uh, I think uh, at first I, I would say uh, the first comment as uh, uh, made by uh, Nick, that is to say that uh, transformations already uh, ongoing uh, will be uh, accelerated uh, with this uh, with this crisis uh, and uh, during the during the crisis and we are still in the crisis of course we can say that uh, 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 oper operators networks have proved a high network reliability with uh, the significant increase in traffic and teleworking uh, quality of service has more or less been maintained and uh, has coped uh, with uh, uh, all this uh, uh, huge traffic increase. In, ter in, in the field of enterprise, uh, it seems, in B2B, it seems that uh, uh, importance of network, collaboration and security services have uh, uh, been uh, revealed in, uh, in this crisis. And uh, uh, after, in the post-crisis period, as I said, there will be acceleration of certain transformations. Let's see uh, some uh, trends such as uh, generalization of uh, con contactless interactions and transactions, for instance, uh, development of data usage in future crises uh, with, uh, in the respect of uh, personal data protection, such as uh, anonymous identification of proximity, uh, controlled geolocation. Uh, but more, we, we certainly will have the opportunity to speak of that a bit later. Virtualization of networks and uh, connected objects ecosystems, enabling later uh, to uh, make the industrial ecosystems programmable to lower their production costs and to shorten the uh, production uh, 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 channels in order to, to make them uh, widely uh, accessible. Of course, 
widening of teleworking and also collective intelligence applications. And uh, finally, uh, with uh, 5G uh, accelerated integration of uh, mobile technologies in networks, uh, conversions, fixed mobile conversions, and for us in Europe, uh, uh, development of this European ecosystem, uh, 5G European ecosystem with operators, manufacturers, and new actors of the vertical industries. So I was just going to build on Jean-Pierre and Duarte's points. One of the really interesting things we're seeing is the uh, lack of impact on productivity in telcos. So like every other company, uh, telecoms has had to put thousands, tens of thousands of people to work from home, sometimes in very challenging circumstances in terms of call centers in regions where that's not very easy. But talking to different leaders around the world, we're seeing that actually productivity is keeping pace pretty well. After the initial challenges and operational impacts, that's actually working remarkably well. And I think that's going to be true in many industries, people realizing that actually remote working can work, uh, even in the, the new normal, as people are calling it. The other point Duarte makes is really important in terms of uh, telecom operators understanding that they can achieve transformation much faster. So the number of executives I've been speaking to who've said, we, we've done things in two or three weeks, we previously would have thought unattainable in two or three years is quite remarkable. So in a way, the situation has actually given the industry a, a little bit of self-belief and the ability to change when it needs to. So what Nick was saying there um, about the speed of transformation we're seeing within the telecoms um, operators themselves, is, is this change in the dynamics of investment models and criteria? Do we think we might see um, the telecom sector suddenly being a more uh, appealing or active sector for investment and deal making? Um, so I, I think we probably will see that. I think that was happening anyway, as I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. I think uh, the uh, investors who previously wouldn't have looked at telecoms infrastructure as an investment, particularly if they were quite risk averse, for example, infrastructure investors who are used to investing in you know, 20 year projects to build a road or a pipeline or something, they have started in the last few years to look at telecoms infrastructure. And uh, it, it's uh, even before COVID-19, that was, that was happening in a very marked way. I think since COVID-19, it will now be easier to, to explain to investors what you're trying to do and what the proposition is. So I think that will, that trend will be accelerated. I think we'll see more investment in infrastructure and in, in broadband networks in particular. Can we quickly just move on to some of the, uh, let's say, uh, man-made external influences on our business because although it seems a lifetime ago it was only the turn of the year where there was so much focus on Huawei and 5G. Um, Duarte, um, do you think the relative increase in governmental interest and political interest in telecoms and the security implications etc um, is going to have a, a long-term impact on our industry? Well, I think it's uh, it's a question that nobody really has an answer. Uh, I think we can always see it from different angles. Uh, obviously, there's a scenario that this can have a lot of impact if uh, there's an escalation of these trade wars and this can will have a huge impact in telecom. So we can see very disruptive scenarios uh, happening between what, and let's put the names on it, between what is happening mostly with US and China. Uh, I'm hopeful that this situation will have to be solved because uh, I think there are a number of other countries in the middle of this. So in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, Africa, that uh, today a lot of uh, telcos and operators are using basically uh, both uh, uh, Chinese you know, networks, but a lot of uh, US uh, equipments and, uh, and publications and software. So uh, there's not really that uh, you are using one or the other. And um, and also there's a number of U.S. companies that are very important for the for the telecom industry, uh, like uh, iPhones and uh, the iPhone, like the well, from uh, from Apple uh, and many others that are producing their products in, in China, that uh, if something escalates, this could be a, a, massive, a massive impact in in the industry we know we know today, so 
I hope that uh, there will be a resolution to this uh, to this conflict. I think the I think. This affects pretty much everyone at uh, at the uh, global level, and uh, this thing is will be sorted out. Uh, obviously, there are some scenarios that these things can go a bit south, and uh, that would probably require uh, basically changes in in the network vendors. Uh, obviously, also changes in the way the, the relocating production of equipments from China to other places. Um, but I, I'm hopeful that this is going to be uh, something that uh, will collectively different countries at the global level will try to sort out. And I think institutions like uh, the TM Forum, GSMA should try to help and try to overcome this situation and avoid something that if there's an escalation, will be very negative to the to the industry. Sorry, um, uh, I'll just make an observation on Huawei. Uh, th they've had very well publicised, significant problems with the US government in particular for uh, quite an extended period now. And I think it's actually been a couple of things to say on that. One is it's quite remarkable how little impact that seems to have had on Huawei's business as, as regards public information. Um, I, I'm quite shocked by that. I certainly wouldn't wouldn't have called that. And uh, I wonder whether, uh, if this pressure continues, whether whether that can continue to stand up in Huawei's results. The other thing to say is that I think the, the British approach, at least before coronavirus, had been quite sensible. Um, the, the British government published the telecom security uh, requirements uh, where, where they didn't go as far as the US was putting pressure on them to do. And, and actually, I think that was, that those outlined quite an, a, a a sensible approach to uh, any high-risk vendor and, and to quite a sensible approach to a definition of a high-risk vendor. So I think the UK, at least uh, when that happened before coronavirus, had a, had a sensible approach. Now, if we're seeing greater protectionism from certain countries, um, will this lead to an increase in or a change of investment, therefore um, maybe new tech investments elsewhere in the world, and therefore maybe an expansion of the ecosystem? Might this be strangely quite beneficial in terms of ex expanding the ecosystem? Well, I think it's going to have a, a range of impacts, Guy. I think, first of all, let's look at what's already been said here, the need for governments to now recognize the importance of digital infrastructure. Certainly here in the UK, there's been so much focus on physical infrastructure investments. Uh, these investments dwarf the kind of investments that have been put into digital. But for all the talk about the parts of the economy that are frozen right now, the parts of the economy that are working are working because of telecoms. And I think for every country in the world, that's going to become highly visible and highly important. The fact that this whole situation has caused a fast forward on people getting comfortable with digital, everybody from sections of society who previously wouldn't have embraced things like video calling, internet banking, and so on, now doing so very rapidly. So you've got an entire B2C sector on fast forward right now to do that. The same happening in B2B to protect normal business operations, make them remotely accessible. So the, the net effect of all of this will be a big focus on digital infrastructure in countries being critical. Now, to your geopolitical point, I think, frankly, that's harder to predict than even the net effect of the COVID situation. Uh, it's been an unpredictable situation for some time. What we've already seen is outside of the US, uh, the typical reaction to that is uh, one of frustration that this is basically slowing down activity. For us in the TM Forum, we believe that collaboration is crucial. Uh, the telecoms industry is built on collaborating. Its success has always come through collaboration. So if we want this technology, we need to move away from some of this protectionist behavior and perhaps focus on how we can address the national needs of countries and governments. Yes, to keep them safe and secure, of course, but also to make sure that they have the right infrastructure for their economies to thrive. And I think that's where we're going to see increased investment uh, from governments in the form of direct investment, also in the form of loosening up and changing regulatory priorities, uh, which will be one of the effects we certainly expect to see. In terms of what it might cause in other types of investment, we really hope it will also lead to uh, new innovation coming from all over the sector. Uh, the, the telecoms industry is gradually as it transforms, starting to embrace 
more startups, more scale up companies. And I think that's going to be an essential part of, of meeting the needs of uh, society as we move forward. Thanks, Nick. Jean-Pierre. Yes, I think, uh, thank you, Guy. Uh, many things have already been done by my colleagues here. But nevertheless, due to the importance of this uh, 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 Huawei uh, issue, uh, trade war, uh, US-China, uh, and also uh, risks of uh, growing protectionism, it's important to, to, see, to, to, to say what we are feeling of that. At first, let's say that uh, uh, even if uh, at last uh, there will be no no issue with uh, with uh, Huawei, for instance. Uh, this will have this conflict will uh, have had uh, the merit to point out the security issues, and uh, more and more uh, network security issues uh, will uh, become, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 key crucial. Uh, so, in the let's say in the worst case. Uh, of course, uh, they could have, from Chinese actors, uh, uh, some obligations uh, due to this uh, new law from the Chinese government in 2017 to collaborate uh, with the intelligence service and so on. So, uh, 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 and not speaking also of uh, via the social credit system of some uh, watchdog uh, to, to be part of watchdog uh, over population on, on that. So. This would be the worst, of course, but we, we have not to neglect that. Uh, but in terms of responses to that, I think the, personally that the European uh, uh, um, policy, uh, European recommendations uh, was uh, the most reasonable one, that is to say to let to the member states uh, the uh, sovereignty of their policies uh, in that matter. Nevertheless, uh, over Europe, uh, uh, tightening, uh, recommending uh, a tightened network security regulations, but no banning the uh, 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 network, Huawei networks. Uh, Huawei in a possibility to participate to, uh, to bids, uh, trials, and so on. In terms of uh, risk of the protectionism uh, and uh, of uh, if the, the, the Huawei case uh, would continue, the risk would be to have perhaps two worlds in the, in the telecom and uh, digital world, uh, two camps. And uh, this would not be good for uh, the globalization of uh, standards, of uh, harmonized spectrum, of uh, 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 technologies, of economies of scale that uh, we want to, uh, to do. Uh, because uh, if uh, this crisis uh, had to, to continue, uh, perhaps China could have the possibility to create its own Asiatic ecosystem or uh, uh, un with some countries uh, with op different operating systems. And uh, it would create a risk to, uh, to create two camps. And of course, for instance, in, in 5G, where I have uh, been very active and still, uh, still uh, been active, we, of course, don't want to uh, find again what we knew uh, for uh, 3G, that is to say, uh, different standards depending on the regions of the world. That's a, that's a point I was uh, coming straight on to, Jean-Pierre. Um, and Duarte, um, you, you were nodding earlier when we were talking about the harmonization of, of collaboration and the importance of collaboration. We must have a, a you know, harmonized approach um, as we develop standards, etc. Um, you know, is, is, there a, is there a risk that we may see a return to what we saw with, with 3G when we had some regional um, variation of specifications, it, you know, it all came to, to nothing in the end, really. It worked itself out. But is there a risk we might go back to those days uh, and fragment or, you know, fork um, the work we're doing globally? Any escalation can lead to that. Uh, I think this, there's a risk, yes. There's definitely a risk if, uh, if we, the leaders at the global level don't try to overcome this, this issue, obviously, uh, there's now a dispute between China and the US, but let's not forget that there is a Europe 
for Europe will have to take a stand here. Uh, and to, to be very honest, uh, I think there's also, if, if this escalation turns up, I don't know if we're going to have, only have two worlds, or suddenly we don't have uh, three worlds or four worlds, because there's also Russia. So um, I hope this doesn't happen. I think there's been, we've been seeing in the last 20 years, 25 years, a, a massive growth of the economy. So we are now living a difficult moment with the coronavirus that is going to affect all the economies in the world. We know that GDPs are going to suffer and probably only going to recover after two or three years. But the reality is that in the last 25 years, we are seeing by far the best, the, 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 the most amazing growth period ever in the in the world of in the history of the, our world, and uh, this is and, and I think is a lot driven by the globalization, by the collaboration, by the fact that basically each country can leverage others to basically what is best on them, and we can circulate and we can basically sell all goods to every country. And, uh, and I really fear that if we go to these trade wars, this globalization is going to be put a bit on hold and we're going to go back to what happened uh, basically before, uh, probably before the Second World War. And that's not good for, not good for, the, for, the, for the world and for, the, and for everyone. And to be honest, I don't think maybe one or country or another can benefit from this but I think there's also a huge risk that uh, individual countries will end up losing because the reality is that today business models for most companies, not just in telco, but everywhere, are sustaining exports, are sustaining the globalization and distribution of production centers. Everybody is also outsourcing different services, uh, basically relocating services, production, everything, selling to different markets. So... I hope uh, that there is good sense and we we are able to sort this out. We need to put in place the security mechanisms across the networks, across the clouds, not just the networks. I think the clouds are becoming also a big part of these networks. We need to ensure that there is the right security mechanisms in place, that this is not used with the, the wrong purposes. That's absolutely correct. But that's not used as an excuse to really stop the, all the benefits we've been seeing with globalization. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, in the end, uh, the good sense and the, the reasoning will, will prevail. Uh, Nick, nobody wants to stifle competition or innovation. Um, is, is, is there a real danger here that the, our global approach and harmonized approach may start to fragment um, to the detriment of, of the industry and ultimately its users? I think if that were to happen, Guy, it will be driven by external factors. I think, as my colleagues on this panel have talked about, where there's been fragmentation in the past around standardization efforts, that's, of course, always had some government hand in it. But in reality, I think the industry today understands that it works extremely well by working as one global industry. And the level of collaboration certainly we see in the TM Forum is at an all-time high as a result of that. So it's, of course, possible that further government inter intervention could stymie that in some way. I think the effects we're going to see are, are quite hard to predict. The, the ones that we certainly expect to see, both through the US-China trade war and uh, this situation with COVID-19, will be a greater focus on supply chain reliability, making sure that uh, everything from spare equipment through to equipment to cope with growth is is readily available. And I think the need for resilience in telecom operators and from a government perspective in that national infrastructure is going to get an extra focus uh, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Thank you. Uh, and, and Mike, I'd love to hear your views as well of the, the, potential, the potential risk to our harmonised approach and the way we've been successfully pushing things forward so far? Yeah, I, I don't know that I've got much to add to the other panel members. I think uh, globalization in the telecom sector, as in every sector, is extremely beneficial for uh, the whole world and for consumers. Uh, and, and I'm concerned uh, about the protectionism. I think I, I was concerned about that before COVID-19. I'm concerned even more uh, that uh, the, 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 the crisis that we've gone through or going through is might lead to, to greater divisions and, and that will be worse for everyone, uh, every country other than a few companies that might benefit, but that's not what policy should be about. 
Thanks. And Jean-Pierre, um, you've been closely involved with five, uh, the 5G PPP in Europe, um, which brings me onto a subject of ecosystems. Um, we are looking to get more closely involved with vertical industries um, and harmonize with what they're doing and support them. Um, might we start seeing a regional split in ecosystems um, supported by the, the major regional trade blocks? Uh, Guy, it's an important question. Uh, all the more that uh, for, with 5G, uh, we are uh, in the middle of the process. It's important to understand uh, that uh, beyond uh, the first announcements, beyond the first launches, uh, 60 networks now, uh, something like 15 million uh, subscribers in beginning this year. Nevertheless, uh, uh, we are still at the, at the beginning of uh, 5G. Uh, and it's important to conduct uh, what we had planned initially uh, in 2014-15 for 5G and particularly in, uh, in Europe with the 5G PPP uh, program that will finish uh, next year with the last uh, project, something like uh, 80 uh, projects uh, in three phases. First one research, second involvement of verticals and third currently uh, uh, trials and pre-commercial phases. Uh, it's important to go uh, to, to, to the end because it's a typical European move approach, even if all regions of the world will do the same, of course, but it was a typical European approach. First, not to launch too fast, as uh, perhaps uh, US, uh, Korea, and even now China uh, uh, do, but uh, really accomplish uh, this new ecosystem with verticals. And uh, for that purpose, uh, one a bit more than one year ago uh, at the 5G PPP, we had initiated uh, 5G vertical users workshops, gathering the actors, uh, gathering the, the actors of this landscape. 3GPP, of course, uh, 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 projects, uh, operators, manufacturers, but also those new verticals, industry vertical associations, 5VAA for automotive, 5VACA for industry of the future, PSC for security, uh, TCCA for cri critical, mission critical, and so on. Uh, and the message last year was, it's already too late for verticals to contribute to 5G standardization for release 16, that will be finalized by the end of June this year and that will lead to the IMT 2020 specifications of full 5G. So it's important that as soon as possible, you get your requirements towards the 3GPP standard bodies, uh, use cases, in order that you participate in this uh, 5G standardization uh, phase. And this was happily done uh, all last year uh, in order to, to feed the future release 17 of FGPP with all those use cases, requirements, platforms uh, that will give at the in September by September 21, really what I call the between brackets, the true 5G integrating all the vertical risk requirements, such as uh, uh, automotive uh, industries and so on. Absolutely, thanks. Um, we we are we are approaching the end of um, our, our discussion, but there's a couple of uh, points I want to just get across first, if I can. Um, Mike, um, do you think in the in the current climate, the way things are moving, um, we might see a shift in terms of M and A um, in the operating market? Might we see a bit of a, a a power play situation arising involving the web scale companies? Are we going to? Are we stable here, or might we see some you know, rapidly changing dynamics? Uh, yeah, no, thanks, Guy. Um, one of the things I love about being a lawyer to the sector is there's always something changing. There's always something new to consider. Uh, just in the last few days, there's been the merger of O2 and uh, Virgin announced in the UK. So that's probably a, a, a good example of the 
of deals which are still happening. And maybe it would have happened uh, in, in any event, but it, but it's certainly a, a, all about convergence. We also saw one of one of the hyperscale operators invested in a telco. Uh, I saw that story last week. Does anyone on the panel remember which one? So who was acquired by Microsoft? Did you say, do I think? Affirmed. Affirmed networks. Right. There was, I think there was another one as well. So we all start. I was, I was Facebook. I remember it's Facebook in India has invested in uh, one of the telcos in India. That's right. Uh, that that is remarkable. I think that you know that hitherto the the internet companies have uh, uh, consciously, I think, uh, refrained from getting involved in in licensed telecoms businesses, with very few exceptions, like fiber companies in a few uh, cities in the states. So uh, that is a remarkable development, I think, uh, and I think we w it may well be that we will see uh, a convergence between internet companies and, and uh, uh, network operators. That, that 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 kind of thing is is um is 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 starting to bring about. So it's a further level of convergence, which means that you know I think we can predict that even more interesting times ahead. Uh, whilst I have you, I would just uh, want to mention one other thing. I, I, I'm. And that is around the, the kind of the paranoia of fake news around 5G and the vandalism that's been uh, in the last few weeks on 5G infrastructure. Um, I guess what I wanted to say about that is I'm concerned about it. Um, I was at a conference in January, but back when we could actually have real, you know, face to face meetings and the conference was about 5G. And I was quite shocked to find at the end of the conference, there was a bunch of people, about three of them, uh, you know, and a dog on a string with a table outside protesting about how awful 5G was. And at the time, I was laughing at them and thought they were, they were ridiculous. Well, I, I'm not thinking they're ridiculous now. I think they're frightening. Uh, and I think the industry should do more to uh, and find out. I'm not sure the best way to address it, because the more attention you give it, the more the more that could be the worst thing to do. But but I'm worried about the effect that that might have um, on, on acceptance of, of the benefits 5G can bring. Can I just pick up on, on a couple of Mike's points there, Guy? I think uh, the this issue of, of M&A, uh, if we went around the world and looked at how many mergers people would like to have happen, but are being blocked by regulation or uh, fear of, of anti-competitive behavior, um, it would be a very long list over the last few years. And I think we have to get real when it comes to government policy about the fact that uh, in reality, you don't want to build multiple sets of infrastructure. And so we've started to see with TDC in Denmark, the first companies voluntarily saying, actually, we're going to spit, split the so-called net, Netco and Servco. We're going to run that as a wholesale business on the network and provide that to many others. That allows us to attract more investment on a long-term basis into infrastructure. I think we, we will and need to see more of that for us to see the build out of infrastructure capability faster and faster. Um, the other thing I just add on the, the 5G discussion is a lot of 5G discussions orientate around the network and the access network. In reality, 5G is so much more. So I think everybody's mind tends to go to just faster connectivity. And there's been questions floating around in the last few weeks around, well, the network seems to be holding up well enough on 4G. Do we need 5G? We absolutely do to cope with the density of devices. Uh, the security protocols in 5G are far more stringent and give us far more flexibility, the energy consumption factors. So there's many technology reasons why to embrace it. I think we will also see though greater and greater partnerships between those network and connectivity providers and those providing services, because in reality, it's the end-to-end -end service the vertical customers want, not just the connectivity. So Nick, I think that's a really interesting uh, thought about the mergers that have been blocked and, and the benefits of splitting out a network company. I, I think, uh, a couple of observations on that. One is, you're right, a number of uh, mergers, horizontal mergers, have been blocked, especially in Europe. There's, there was some suggestion a few months ago that the new European Commission might take a, a different approach. I'm not sure that they would do in the case uh, of a four to three mobile merger, for example, that, that, like, like the um, 023 merger that was proposed a, a few years ago in the UK. I think that would probably still be blocked. I don't think, incidentally, that the Virgin Mobile um, O2 merger will be blocked and that raises far fewer issues. But on this point about splitting networks and operating companies, we've seen a few countries doing this. I think it can work and it can work very well where it's done at the initiative of the owners of the infrastructure. Uh, OpenReach actually is, is a good example of, of one that I think has been 
uh, really quite successful. Um, where it doesn't work so well is where the government supports it. Uh, I'm not sure that Australia's model has been a great success. I've seen we've been working on um, an, an attempt to do something similar in Bahrain. Uh, it's probably a bit early to say, but I certainly don't see good signs there. Uh, so I think uh, a big, uh, where it's a voluntary decision of, of the owners of the infrastructure, I think it could be very beneficial, it could be done very well. Uh, where it's forced by the government, it could have really quite bad effects. Uh, South Africa was another country that was considering forcing uh, operators to use uh, a state-owned uh, infrastructure company, and I think that had all the hallmarks of, of uh, something going very badly wrong. Fully agree. Fully Thank agree. you. And Duarte, if I can... Um, um ask you some final um, observations there um, about the, the changing dynamics of the operator landscape perhaps and uh, the impact that some of the, the hyperscale companies may be having and shaking up the landscape. Yes, definitely. I, I think there will be a lot of changes in the years to come. I think 5G is going to introduce a disruption. Not um, Probably it's not going to be just with the first try 5G with the 3.5 band. I think as we move to the millimetric band, where we can really get uh, the benefits of the of, of 5G. Uh, this is going to force much more collaboration. So what we see on shared infrastructure in the on the wireline is going to also happen in the wireless. It's in pretty much impossible to deploy uh, three or four different 5G networks in a millimetric band. There's not no real real estate assets to deploy this. It will be basically uh, invaded by antennas everywhere. So this is going to force pretty much that operators will, uh, that's something that they are doing today and doing kind of a lot of run sharing deals. And I think we're going to start to have more national uh, networks because uh, it will be very hard to, to have probably more than two in each country. Um, and then I believe that the, there will be also these uh, new players, uh, the hyperscalers, so that will enter into this business. I think this acquisition by by Microsoft of a firm, that's just a, just a signal. Uh, I think uh, also all the hyperscalers are trying to really develop their business and, and develop propositions to think about what people call these 5G private networks to really develop networks to towards the large companies to develop uh, their uh, to develop their verticals. I think this is uh, happening, and I'm very sure that uh with the standardization that the 5g is going to bring and not just uh, at the at the standards of the technical standard layer but also uh, evolution to microservices and uh, opening the networks into modular components and apis will allow many players to enter into this um, into into this business and obviously hyperscalers will have a word to say since a lot of these services will going to be a mix of services delivered at the edge, so close to the access, but also at the central level on, on the cloud, that is going to require a lot of processing capacity. So I think this is going to be, uh, as always, uh, fun times. I think this is one of the reasons I really like to work in this industry, is that uh, whenever we think things are getting stable, there's always something new happening. And so I think the industry, once again, will have to reinvent. I think industry has been very successful in reinventing themselves. But obviously, this is going to require most likely uh, different business models, uh, not uh, from not just from a technical level, but also from a commercial level, and the way uh, telcos will have to to work to basically uh, continue su supporting and providing services to to their customers. So yes, definitely, this is going to be uh, interesting times. I think five G is a bit. The opening out of the door of this, but there are many other things happening with the uh, SDNs and what all the SD1s and SDNs can do on the networks, 5G and all the utilization. Uh, I think there's a new era coming that will uh, force telcos to basically adapt and to basically transform to, to continue providing services, but also will help uh, other players to come to market and uh, increase innovation and competition in, in this industry. Look, so many important points uh, raised this morning. Um, appreciate all of them. There's a lot for us to follow up and we will follow them up. Um, but for now, we are in danger of, of going straight into the next panel. So we better wrap it for now. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us remotely on this session. And if you have any questions for our guests or any additional comments or views you wish to add, then please do get in touch with us. 
If you want to be part of the ongoing conversation, then you need to join us on our brand new discussion programme, Extra Shot, with Telecom TV's editorial director, Ray Lemaitre. Get in touch with us now through social media or email. All the sessions this week will also be available for on-demand viewing right here on Telecom TV. So if you are unable to join us at the scheduled times, you will still be able to catch up on the discussions. Coming up next on DSP Leaders World Forum 2020 is our session on edgenomics. And if you want to find out what that's all about, then you'll be able to watch it later today from 4 p.m. UK time. But for now, a final thank you to all our panelists and to you for watching. Goodbye.